I'm Jean-Marc Lim, and on behalf of the team here at JSA, thank you for tuning in to our latest virtual CEO roundtable, also our last one of 2021. But before we get started, I wanted to quickly share that JSA is seeking top innovators across the globe, across the globe to collaborate on a book entitled Greener Data, Insights on Reducing Carbon Emissions from Leaders in Digital Infrastructure. The book will make its Amazon debut on Earth Day on the 22nd of April, 2022. If you'd like to learn more about the book and submit for a co-author of consideration, please visit jsa.net slash greener data. But back to today's event, um, our first 100 registrants for this stream will have received a fresh lunch delivered to your door or a gift card to order your own meal. And today we are excited to share our JSA virtual roundtables on a new platform to include the first in the industry virtual networking experience with a unique opportunity to talk face to face with other event attendees before and after the panel. Make sure you head back to the networking lounge after the discussion for live networking with speakers and attendees of today's event. As a quick reminder for everyone who has joined us today, we look forward to your participation during this event. So please feel free to add any questions that you may have into the chat or request the mic to come on camera and ask your question directly to our speakers. If you have any questions about upcoming roundtables, whatever it may be, such as how to register or how to participate, feel free to reach out to us through our website at jsa.net. And also, by the way, just as a reminder to mark in our calendars, our next virtual roundtable will cover telecom and data centers and look at the lessons learned and predictions for the new year. And without further delay, let's get started. Today, we'll be looking at the state of the European data center and network infrastructure market. As 2021 draws to a close and COVID is still plaguing our world, forcing new ways to engage and do business, it's time to take a temperature check on our network infrastructure market and in the state of the European data center partnerships, opportunities, challenges, and predictions for 2022. It is my pleasure to also introduce to you our exceptional executive lineup, which includes Anthony Clarkson, Technical Director for EMEA in India at Precision OT, David Barker, Founder and CTO of 4D Data Centers, Alex Rabbit, Director of Corazon and Managing Director for the European Data Center Association, Gary Connolly, Founder of Host in Ireland, and Tash Mehta, Associate Director at Vipa Digital. Um, I mean, I'm actually quite excited to have this lineup of speakers. I'm sure this discussion is going to be really, really engaging. So before going in with like any clever questions, I'm just going to ask you a general question um, to, to the panelists. I mean, how do you describe the current state of the market? Who would like to, to take the first shot? I'll there you go, David. Jump in first then. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you win the race here. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's it's very good, um, to, to put it short. Um, across europe um obviously more familiar with the london market that's where we we operate um there's been a lot of demand over the past 12 18 months um there's still a lot of supply coming online um some of that supply is is delayed due to uh various mostly supply constraints from construction um but overall we're we're seeing extremely high demand uh, a lot of people still moving IT out of their offices, a lot of on-prem still migrating into data centers, um, and a lot of growth in um, people doing um, services that facilitate remote working. Hmm. Okay. Um, Tash? Um, yeah, I mean, really just adding to what David said, um, there has been a huge increase in demand and, um, you know, we can all think that as a result of COVID, people working from home just increase use for um, phones, smart, smartphones, we were talking about. Um, and yeah, working from home, there's, it's just huge at the moment. I also predominantly know the London area because that's where I'm based, but um, in all of the kind of flat D as, as the term is, um, you know, Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, Paris, Dublin, they're, they're growing in all of the other, other parts of EMEA as well. Okay. Well, um, Gary, would you like to add this, the, the Dublin side of things? I, I, I guess it's it's extraordinary what's happening, really, because um, we, we've heard so much about the Industrial Revolution 4.0 that commenced, you know, in and around 2017. And from there, you know, you heard a lot of C-level people talking about digital transformation. And I think what we've seen over the last 18 months in particular is a digital acceleration. So for those that were already on that journey, internal, external, whether it's business to business or business to consumer, the acceleration and adoption of digital services, it, for many companies, as the other two speakers said, 
uh, whether it's via the handset, whether it's via a headset, or whether it's via um, uh, desktops, um, it's been a lifeline for business, and it's not going to change. You know, habits, this is the key thing I think that we're seeing now, is that if we had had this disruption for six months, habits may not have formed, but we're entering into our second full year of businesses being transformed and having to depend on the infrastructure, including the centers of data, and it's not going to be reversed. So I think from a, 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 a Dublin perspective with uh, the growth that we're seeing, uh, it's on a percentage, you know, year on year, same as the other North Virginia, Frankfurt, London, Amsterdam, and Paris. I mean, I think we're all looking at 24, 25% compounding annual, you know, growth. But the big difference is in, 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 in Dublin is projects that were predicted for 2024 to start are already out of the ground. So we've eaten into what you'd call that fat that was there for that spike that sort of fat is starting to diminish. And now we're starting to, to eat into what we thought we'd need for 2024 and beyond. So I think it's just uh, uh, starting. I know that's hard for people to believe. But I think for those that are in the data and, and look at IDC and look at Gartner, when you look at sort of the predictions for 2027, that the amount of data in the world today is only 16% of the data that will be here in 2026 or 27, you know, think about, okay, it won't be one-on-one, -on -one, but it's just starting because digital is not first anymore with businesses. It's nearly digital only. And by the way, we have off offline stuff as well. Should you, should you want to have a look at it? I mean, I mean, what you're saying is amazing because uh, we've seen uh, Microsoft this year announcing the intention to build 50 to hundred data centers, um, a year just to try and cope with this as an example. Uh, I mean, we used to get excited about one data center, $1 billion. Now we get anything below $1 billion, it's almost not even worth um, writing about. So, I mean, it's really accelerating. Um, and I mean, Facebook is investing $26 billion this year alone. That's more than most data center companies' valuation um, at the moment, and that's only one company. But Alex, give us an, uh, an overview of the European um, situation. So yeah, so Europe is 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 like everywhere else. It's buoyant. It's it's happening everywhere. But I think what's interesting is that um, some of the Nordic countries are coming up now, and and there's a huge amount of development going on up there. Um, there's a huge amount of development going on in Eastern Europe, which was wasn't there before. The connectivity is there now. The power has always been there. Um, so I think that uh, that you know it is an incredibly buoyant market at the moment, and everywhere, just literally everywhere, we're in Flapty. Flap we kind of all know about. It's kind of been there for a while now. Um, but there's there's other other places that are up and coming. You know, Marseille, Lyon, um, other you know, just other cities now that are really beginning to come up and up behind. And I think it's it's great because it's it just shows you know, that the growth in the industry is huge. Yeah, I mean, we, we've seen a lot of um, movements in the north, especially in the north. I mean, all the acquisitions that we've seen: Green Mountain, Digiplex, um, the, the the birth of new companies in Finland. Uh, willing to spend $1 billion. Um, we've seen all the development across the entire of Southern Europe, um, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, um, exactly. South of France. So it's it's incredible what's happening in this market. Um, Anthony? Yeah, not much to add to what the other speakers have said, really, just that we are seeing kind of <laughs> phenomenal growth, whether that's in existing capacity and existing data centers or new data center builds from new players as well as um, existing players expanding into new territories. It's kind of growth every, everywhere, really, and it's it's because of those bandwidth demands. I mean, every day I'm seeing reports from some of the service providers across Europe that they're hitting their maximum data transferred on their own, own internal networks and external networks. They they keep breaking records every week. It's the the data usage is phenomenal, and with them with the working from home, it's it's just getting bigger and bigger. Um, do, we, do we have any fears that that usage might drop um, once people start getting back to work? I guess not in the next two months, unfortunately, over the next maybe six to eight months. Did you guys see any change? Um, they're they're of... not going back to work. They're not <laughs> going back. There was a survey out yesterday that said that said out four out of five people who, who worked from home during the pandemic do not want to ever go back to the office. So it, it just won't change. It's going to it's just going to keep rising, I believe. Mm. 
the profile uh, gel will change. You know, what happened ultimately during the first phases of the pandemic was the amount of data that was being manipulated and used was similar. It was just wasn't being manipulated through a big pipe into a business. It was being distributed into smaller pipes into people's homes. But effectively, what, what you found was the value of a centralized data system or a hybrid data system came to the fore. And what we're finding now, and to the other speaker's point, is that a lot of people during that period that maybe had still a lot of on-premise stuff realized they couldn't get essential workers to their office, so they couldn't get into their office, so they couldn't get access to the office. So I think what it's facilitated is, you know, hybrid, the it's coming away from your on-premise to a, a co-location managed services. So where the data is manipulated from and where the data centers, because this is a key thing, why clusters will remain strong like FlapD is because for every packet of data that goes to a device, there could be up to 10 packets of data between data centers. So that's why the interoperability is so important for the clusters. So I think the data itself as a dataverse or what they call it now, the new metaverses, yeah? They're growing and growing, but what's happening is that you've a more B to B. You've got more machine to machine, data center to data center, data center to end user, data center to businesses. But effectively, it's constantly growing. But it's just coming from different places. And I mm -hmm. guess some of the other speakers will talk about the edge and stuff like that. But homes are just a new or a variant of the edge, aren't they? That's all they are. <laughs> In, well, it is the edge. It's just wherever you access your data and whether it's a device or your eyeball. So let's look at the end user's homes like a small node on the edge, right? The edge of the edge. <laughs> the edge um, of the edge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Anthony, uh, David, sorry. Uh, yeah, I, th I think we could have a whole other panel discussion on how you define edge. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, four, four, uh, yeah, five years down the line, we still haven't we still haven't come up with a yeah. definition. Um, so to kind of echo what, what the other people have said, uh, what we've seen in our customer base is a lot of people who either couldn't access their offices during the lockdowns, uh, or have decided to downsize or move out of city centre locations, are giving up their offices, and they're taking the IT they had on prem, putting it into a data centre, and everyone's just connecting remotely into that. So even if their workers go back into the office, they're still going to connect remotely from their office to the, the data center location. Um, and we've seen, I would say that's probably been the driver of two thirds of the deals we've done in the last 18 months is people on-prem. Um, mm. And I think that says quite a lot to, I remember five years ago, six years ago, everyone saying all the on-prem stuff is gone. It's already out of people's offices. There's no more on-prem to move. And I think what this has shown in the last 18 months is there's still a lot of IT on-prem in people's people's offices. David, they often say there's no more COBOL in the world and yet there's an <laughs> awful lot of COBOL. <laughs> and the cloud's going to kill the data center market. <laughs> you know? Well, it's called the, the, the clickbait headlines <laughs> to, to attract the eyes in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, actually, uh, I mean, David, the, the, now that you're bringing the, um, the idea of actually people going to data centers more outside of the um, the, the, the city centers, um, th that's actually a trend that we've seen growing in the last few years. And I guess in the last 24 months, and especially this year, we've really seen um, the, the, the main metros, the, the expansion outside the main metros take place, uh, not just in the UK, but across Europe. I mean, in uh, Ireland is the same thing. Uh, we've seen it a bit in the Nordics. We've, we are seeing, starting to see it now in France as well, uh, more heavily. Um, how do you guys see the trends of um, operators moving outside of the big cities? Um, is this, I guess, it, it will be sustained, I guess, from what you just said. Um, but how do we see this spanning out over the next, say, five to ten years? Um, I think it will it will continue because the only places that have got space to build new data centers are outside of city centers. Um, you've got some constraints on fiber and network connectivity in areas, but there that's overcomable with with enough capital certainly for, for people like microsoft and, and facebook they can solve those problems um i mean one of the reasons our, our data centers have been outside we never opened one in central london um and that's mostly because the cut the engineers of our customers don't live in the center of cities and having been a customer of telecity and equinix and everything in the past 
or red bus in our Europe as it was, um, going from where you live into a city centre to go to a data centre is a pain. <laughs> no one really wants to do it. So if you can bring the data centres out of the city centre, you make access easier, they're cheaper to build, they're cheaper to run, um, and you're generally, both going back to the edge term, you're closer to where your users are. Hmm. Okay. Um, Anthony? Yeah, I, I was just going to say something very similar is, as we just discussed, the kind of the profile of where the workplace is, is changing. The workplace isn't in the city centres anymore. And coupled with that, the mass rollout of fibre infrastructure across the whole of the region has, has meant that there aren't the not spots anymore that there were is, yeah, if you Facebook or Google, you build your data center wherever the power's cheap because you'll get fiber to it. But nowadays, you can get fiber anywhere and it's becoming more ubiquitous, which makes it easier. And location becomes less about being close to everybody else because everybody else is spread out. Hmm. That, that's actually a very good point because we've seen also a lot of investments in 2021 um, around just um, rural, rural inclusion building fiber networks um, across rural areas of several different countries, especially in, um, in France. Even today, I was just reading a $3 billion, a three billion euro um, roadmap to build France's rural fiber networks. Um, Alex, I think you wanted to, to add something. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, you know, I think, I think that the, 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 the flat D kind of model, I think will change. I know that Gary won't like me saying this, but I think it will change in the sense that there will be additions to flat D. Flat D will always be there. It will always be a requirement. Um, but but there will be additional places, additional new hubs that come along. Um, and I think that's probably a good thing um, because you know flat D has had its issues over the over the last few years. Um, but but you know you're going to see more hubs coming in, in from different areas. Um, that I think that I think demand goes back to what David said. Really, um, you know the demand is 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 not in those major cities anymore. Um, it is certainly true that interoperability is still important, but equally, um, the demand will be driven by different factors. So, you know, it may be driven by sustainability, it may be driven by cost, it may be driven by by, by location of, of engineers, but certainly there are going to be new hubs, I believe. Hmm. Okay, hundred uh, percent, and 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 let's let's hope for a global society perspective that happens as well, because. You know, what's often forgotten about these forums, and certainly um, when I go to events, there's not enough discussion around data, way too much discussion around centers. We don't need centers unless we understand data. And not all data is the same. You know, not all cats running up curtains needs to be in a high latency sensitive, very high energy location. It can be anywhere. It can be up as high in the north as you can have it. Um, so what we have to and what we're going to start to see now becoming more and more prevalent is, you know, we're entering an era where we're going to have 160 to 170 zettabytes of data. That's not going to sit in 10 metros. There'll be portions of that which will be analytics requirements. So that can be anywhere it needs to be. You're going to have time sensitive stuff and that's going to need to be other closer to other data sensitive data. And then you're going to have other stuff that's going to genuinely be, need the, to be close to the device that it needs to be close to. Mm -hmm. So when we look at data and we look at the trends in data, that will dictate to a great degree where the centers go. So it's no surprise that you're seeing multiple billion dollar euro rollouts everywhere, because ultimately where you have 40 million people, that's classified as a proximity zone for data. So what is that proximity zone for data? It's the end users want access to Airbnb, Spotify, Netflix. So these providers are on top of the hyperscales and to a great degree are AWS. So everywhere you see a 40 million catchment, whether that's Milan, whether that's Marseille, whether that's Nairobi, you're gonna see a, a proximity zone. So I think what will happen and what I'd like to hope will happen is more and more of the center people start to learn more about data and then we can actually sell the value of the data center industry to policymakers and people because when i listen to data center people talking about their value it's always about energy it's always about water it's all about the how and they don't talk about the why mm -hmm. so exactly what alex is saying you know there are 
physical constraints in metros, whether they're North Virginia, whether they're Singapore, Frankfurt, London, you know, there's two total different sciences at play here. There's photonic science and there's electron science. And one, since Faraday, goes very slowly. It's a big, arduous, capital-intensive industry. The data industry has just always been so nimble. So I think the more people, if you want to understand where the centers are going to reside, learn about the different subsets of data. Mm. And there will, there's so much data, it'll all be that type of data there, that type of data there, that type of data there. And that's, to me, what I think will ha have to happen for us to have more informed and better discussions with journalists, with policymakers, with all of these people. Because right now they just see big sheds sucking in electrons. Hmm. Why? Yeah. And can I just can I just comment there, on Joe, on, on something that yeah. Gary said? Because I think it's re really interesting. This. I mean, first of all, I, I agree with Gary what you're saying. Um, you know, that there is too much discussion about the centre and not enough about the data. I, I, I totally agree with you. Um, I think we, we one thing we've missed is smart cities, which I think are going to drive data centre construction in a, in a new way. Um, but I also think that, that that Gary makes a really really good point here about the whole industry and the way it talks and i've you know joe i've said this before but you know people are always talking about i've got a 100 megawatt data center i've got a 150 megawatt data center i've got this i've got that it's ridiculous this mine's bigger than yours what they should be saying is look here are the benefits of my data center this is what happens this is how you get your netflix this is how you get to do the things that you do this is how we get a, a, a vaccine for this pandemic you know mm. these are the benefits forget the power nobody's interested in the, in the, in the amount of power you've got what they're interested in is the benefits you bring to society and to the economy. And I think that's just something that, as an industry, we've been absolutely terrible at for years and years and years. We've just been going, oh, I've got 100 megawatts of, 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 of power. And it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, 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 just, it's just silly. But um, let me bring in Tash now, because you've also written a, a piece recently on this, um, which was a really good thought leadership piece. So, uh, Tasha, share, us, share with us your, um, your thoughts. It, yeah, it's um, really, we've been looking at the, I guess, the tier two data centre market. I mean, a, a few of the other panellists have already spoken about how um, the Flap D region isn't, isn't you know, not the only region. And I think we've mentioned a few of the other areas which are being looked at, the Nordics, Milan, Eastern, Eastern Europe as well. And um, yeah, I think it's just really adding on to, to what has been said, obviously, the increased demand um and just that, I mean, there. You think about all of the areas where there's a high population, where there's a lot of, I guess, younger people as well. There's demand for IT and services, all of that concentration, and it's it's throughout Europe, of course. So, you you can't just have you know the data centers in in certain parts of, in in those parts where they traditionally have been. Like they they need to be everywhere because they are needed. No, absolutely. Uh, before I carry on, let me just ask if any uh, attendees wants to ask any questions, do put them in the box now and then we'll go through them um, in a few minutes, uh, in about 10 minutes or so. Um, I know we, we've already kind of mentioned energy um, and we can talk about benefits as well on top of energy, but there's a lot of conversation around energy um, in Europe. So I just wanted to ask you guys if you think a lot of this conversation is panic or do we have a real issue on our hands? Um, in terms of providing power to um, to facilities, um, who because we we've seen a lot of things. We've seen things in, in Dublin, uh, in Ireland. Uh, we've seen in uh, in the Netherlands. We've seen um, in in the UK as well. At some in some places, um, there's a few other markets out there. They are having this this conversation, this problem. Um, new markets are up and coming markets. They are having this discussion now, especially around hydrogen and everything. Um, what what do you guys think? Because we've also got a natural energy crisis on our hands um, in terms of just it, even heating houses and all this sort of thing. So. Um, give us your view. Who would like to go first, Gary, David? You see, you're starting from you're starting from a great place there. That, that there's a Europe has an energy security and supply issue hmm. due to non data center related stuff. However, if one was to believe the press, national, international, you'd think that data centers were responsible for everything to do with energy crisis blackouts and all these other very highly emotive uh, words the reality is is the world and if you looked at cop 26 and you took 
the takeaways, there are two mega trends going on right now. There's a decarbonization of all of our societies on every level. And that decarbonization, particularly for transport and for home heating, is going to depend on electrical grids. So those electrical grids in their own right are going through a massive autonomous decarbonization process, which is challenging when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine and we can't make green hydrogen efficient cost. So that in its own right is a challenge, irrespective of anything. Then we throw on the second mega trend, which is back to what we said earlier of the fourth industrial revolution, which is the digitalization of the planet or the dematerialization of the planet created by digital. Yeah. And you then throw that on top of this natural decarbonization and something has to give. One is at a thousand miles an hour. As our, our, our co-panelists were talking earlier, we can change the speed between data centers by time of 10 by two cards going into two routers. That's it. That's all we have to do on a different end of fiber. You try that with, with uh, electricity. So when those two universes collide, guess what? You don't just have scientific collisions. You have mindset collisions as well. Because no disrespect to anybody that's on this call that comes from a grid development or an engineering uh, background for electricity, but it's a different mindset to the data mindset. If we're not changing every 10 months, we're going through slow. Traditionally, grids haven't changed that much in 100 years. So that's a whole philosophy colliding. But it's easy, isn't it? When you have change, you have different reactions. Some people embrace it. Some people beat it up. And some people run away and there's no running away from the digitalization thing and it's causing conflict and the overall desire now should be like what we have now in dublin for instance we're lucky to this regard we've built the national climate action plan top level feeding into that is the national grid development to be decarbonized by 80 percent and feeding into that is how are we going to facilitate another two gigawatts of data centers? So that gives us some wiggle room um, as this thing to try and to, which is happening in so many other places, transpose an industry on top of an already industry that's trying to get its head around security of supply, cost. And then, of course, and I, I, I'll leave it to the other speakers, we've had such a unique situation the last seven months. It's called the Great Cam. It's been called the lowest wind in Europe in 70 years. So what that's done is that's taught us, hey, we better get working on another option as well as wind, as well as solar. And that's why you've got so many discussions now around nuclear again, right? I mean, we had the perfect known storm <laughs> over the last few months. Um, that, that's what they call it, the great, the great calm. You have to have a label for everything these days, don't we? Of course you have to. I mean, <laughs> what's a storm without a name as well? And like anything without a name or an acronym. They've um, got a lot worse since we've named them. That's what I've noticed. <laughs> we've lost <laughs> that. Um, Alex, let's, let me bring you into this as well, because you're very involved uh, with the energy conversations. There's also the European Data Center Pack, um, Energy Pack. Sorry, I forgot the exact name of the pack, but you can correct me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so yeah. I just, just just make a very quick point of what Gary was, was saying there. I mean, I think that... The, as an industry, and I go back to what I said earlier about changing language, as an industry, we have brought this on ourselves when we've talked constantly about power, about the amount of power we've got in reservation and the amount of power we want, etc. This is what's given governments the impression that, that that we that we are pariahs and that we're actually you know responsible for all the blackouts and the shortages and everything else, which of course is not actually true. Um but just to mention, yeah, the climate climate neutral data center pact it's called. Um so that's that's a pact that was um, initiated by the European Data Centre Association in conjunction with SIPSI. Um, and what uh, it's about is basically uh, we have a, a, an agreement and we are creating a pathway. I can't say it's fully created. We are creating a pathway now um, to actually become climate neutral by 2030. Um, now, 
the pact is obviously a you know fantastic thing with signatures to it uh range from everybody from the big hyperscalers down to smaller operators down to really small operators but you know the, the signatures are enormous i can't remember the actual number anymore um but uh but the, the point about it is that you know as an industry we have got to look inward as well i mean we are great for the environment if that's the truth we you know whilst we've talked about power for, for years and and given governments the impression that we're we're, we're not good for the, for the environment we are you know if you want the latest ed shear in cd what's what's better for the environment download it from the internet or go and extract minerals from the ground and transport them and make them into plastics print them sort of package them distribute them and get them to a shop and i get in my car and go and buy it and it's clearly better to download it um so and, and that, that that analogy can be applied to the automotive industry to food to whatever you want to apply it to so we data centers are very good for the environment, um, but we have given the impression uh, through our own language that we are in fact bad for the environment because all we've talked about for 20 years, over 20 years, um, as I'm obviously ancient, so I remember when this all started, uh, when I used to work, work many years ago in, in what was called intelligent buildings before anybody had even thought of data centers. Um, but when this all started, um, the first thing that everybody did was, oh, I've got this much power and I've got this much. And that's really what's brought it on ourselves. So we've got to change now the way we talk. And when we talk to, to Europe, when, we, when we're through the Climate Neutral Data Centre Pact, we're talking to Europe all the time and we're talking to the commissioners uh, and we're talking to the, to, to the policymakers. And when we're talking to them, we've had to change the way we talk and start talking about the benefits that we bring. The data, if you like, what Gary said. Um, you know, we've we've got to start talking about the benefits and 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 stop talking about power because the first thing they do is they come to the table and they say, "Well, you're responsible for all this power use." So we've got to change. No, I absolutely make a very good point, and it's a, it's a circular economy. I mean, you just take away all the packaging and everything. Um, I think the main takeaway is that you like Ed Sheeran. Um, you're a fan of Ed Sheeran. <laughs> um, <laughs> it could have been anybody. Well, it could have been Ava. <laughs> no, no, um, David. <laughs> um. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was going to make the same point about efficiency of systems. Mm. Um, it's something that's almost always missed is how much uh, more efficient a system can be when it's moved from an office into a data center or how much less carbon is used by people doing things like this rather than traveling up to a center or flying abroad to attend an event. Um, and that is all enabled by data centers. Um, but we do have an industry problem that every single conference I go to, it's going so-and-so is building 100 megawatts, so-and-so is building 150 megawatts. Um, and it was even on this panel, this, when we were talking about it earlier, it was 100 megawatts here, 100 megawatts there, um, which annoys me as well, because no one ever talks about the small data centers. And we uh, we run sort of three, four megawatt facilities, uh, which always get left out of every kind of market analysis. Um, so there is a whole section of the market that no one ever talks about. Um, but I mean, data centers themselves, we have economic incentives to be efficient and to reduce our power consumption. So power is the biggest cost. Um, and that's like one of the reasons why we've gone to highly efficient cooling systems in our data centers. We weren't forced to do it, but we've put in adiabatic systems and cooling towers and got our one of our sites running at about 1.17 PUE. And the other one's running about 1.3, 1.29. Um, so we already have an economic incentive to to reduce our consumption. Um, but it does sometimes feel a little bit like uh, data centers and consumption reduction is being scapegoated for a underinvestment in grid infrastructure and power generation. Um, and that's certainly the feeling I've, I've kind of got at the moment is Absolutely. They don't want to put the long-term project planning into building a new grid or a smart grid or a whole load of new uh, nuclear power stations or wind farms. So they're going, actually, just reduce your consumption. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, in terms of energy crisis, yeah, to an extent, I think it's more of a natural gas crisis rather than an, an electricity mm -hmm. crisis, um, particularly acute in the UK because we're so reliant on natural gas because we, we haven't had any wind. Um, and we've switched all of our power over to wind. Um, uh, but I think that that will ease going into next year. Uh, I think what you're saying about um, using data sense as an excuse as well, um, it's, it's a very, very good point and an important point. And we're seeing that taking to an extreme now in Russia, for example, 
um, where they are really looking into new taxes and everything and almost just shutting um, hosting businesses down um, and blaming blackouts on data centers. Um, Anthony. Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk a bit about technology and technology, technological advancement. Obviously, uh, with newer data centers, it's newer equipment, which is less power hungry. But also, as we increase the speeds, the, the, the kind of watts per gigabit is, is decreasing every time we introduce an, a, a new technology. And just to kind of give some, some numbers around it, if you look at kind of traditional 10 gig ports, 10 gig ports are in the kind of one watt per gig, uh, one watt for 10 gigs kind of range. And, and you, when you go to 100 gigs, you're not timesing that by 10, you're timesing it by two or three. Hmm. And then when you go to 400 gig, you times it by two or three again, not times it by four from 100. So you can kind of have 400 gigs in sub 10 watts versus your 10 gig at one watt. And obviously, as we're using more data and we're using more power overall, but it's kind of some devices are still only going to need small amounts of data. It's a lot of small amounts of data that we're serving. So we are reducing that power consumption power consumption per gigabit and that that's going to be critical and that's only going to get better as we advance to higher speeds and we move away from electrical switching moving to optical switching there's big power savings to be made there so there's there's things we can do to to reduce that that footprint by reducing our power consumption with technology um and i guess if, i mean we can even now go into artificial intelligence and bring that in as well and there would be a whole nother topic but um tash let me bring you in as well um for you to share your thoughts with this yeah i mean I, I agree with everything um that the panelists have said um i do think they were taking into account that data centers have been made out to be what they are with, with power consumption but ultimately you know there is an aspect of that which is true and i think it's it's great that that companies have signed up to um the pledge and everything and Obviously, as David said, you know, there's already tracking that needs to be done for um, economic incentive. But I also feel like PUE is good, but it's just the tip of the iceberg, really. And, and there's more that could be done. Um, the, the kind of technology software part of it also. I mean, there are other aspects. We've looked at other ways of cooling natural resources, but looking at the, the software, looking at the whole supply chain kind of. I think the next step is, you know, it's great that the companies have signed up to the pledge, but but how will we make sure that this happens? You know, what, what are the next steps? How how do we make sure that the whichever company doesn't just say, okay, we've signed up to, you know, being carbon neutral. How do we how do we do this? It's I think the conversations really need to to move into that. Hmm. We're really getting to the fifth gear and also start taking action. Um, yeah. there's things that we there's things out there that we don't actually need to discuss anymore there's small things that we can start doing um across every building to just bring the, the carbon footprint down um alex yeah i was just going to say there are measures in place um through the carbon neutral uh, data center pack you know there there are actual measures people have to report um that report is anonymized data but it but it's absolutely you've got to you can't just say well i've signed up to the pact and that's it you know tick move on you've got to actually demonstrate that you really are doing what what, what you're saying you're doing um so i think that's a really good point i just want to say david i spent most of my life talking about small data centers so there is someone talking about it yeah <laughs> i've written a little, bit about, I've written <laughs> exactly. a little bit about boutique ones as well <laughs> yeah. but i promise i'll do better <laughs> Joe, you know when you when you think about it it's a very young industry it never mm. has an industry been perpetrated on the earth that has taken over everybody's life so quickly mm -hmm. you know in 15 years there wasn't a smartphone let's call it that 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 that's been the absolute arm you know the increase in year on year so words matter you know protocols matter all that other stuff matters but there is generally an acceptance that data is going nowhere but how we what we call it is so important so all of the panelists as individually have just been noting it down, said smart at least once. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now smart is only smart, smart grid, smart thermostat, smart car, smart city, smart anything is only smart because of data. Now, if I ask all policymakers to say, do you know that the decarbonization of Paris with the smart city initiative by 40% is due to data? Because that's what makes it smart. They'd say, 
really? That's the difference. We need to stop using generic words and actually start making them tangible. So mm -hmm. smart should be replaced with uh, um, data. So it should be called data cars or data thermostats, whatever, because that's just been misconnected. The other is we, we, we also use because we, we possibly within the industry don't know enough about it. Also mention way too much about social media. So what the perception is, is that uh, social media is what driving all these big data centers. Not the fact that Facebook also runs, what is it, two and a half million SME businesses. <laughs> you know, it's a social media, it's cats running up curtains. So that basically gives people a, a particular perspective. The other point, which is probably one that we should get behind, is a set of numbers, a global set of numbers that people are comfortable talking about, robust, and we can talk about. Because just today I saw from some of the competing geographies within Europe alone, 18% are saying if the world's electricity will be used by data centers, that's why you should move to us. So that's just what the media will pick up on. That's what policymakers will pick up on, the biggest one. So while uh, Alex and the boys are getting beaten up in, in, they will find that particular term of reference. Whereas we need a, a, a set, and what we've been using, and I think that it, 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 it I, I, I think it's robust enough to say because it's in its fourth year, is the International Energy Association's numbers. Hmm. Yeah. And it's extraordinary because it encapsulates all that the other speakers have said. In the past 10 years, we've seen a 12 and a half time increase in transmission of data and a seven and a half times compute for a 3% increase in electrical use. Why? Because like what um, David was saying, there have been thousands of small wiring closets with servers and data centers on premise being consolidated into much more efficient. But we need a set of numbers that can capture all that and, uh, you know, otherwise, we have to believe that the industry is misunderstood, therefore easy targets and under attack. So the best thing to do when you're under attack is to get everybody behind a set of plan and the numbers. So when I hear 18 percent from some of the geographies, that's the reason why you should move to us. That's not a good day in the office because that's what the policymakers, the journalists not you, of course, because you're a well-researched founder. You, you don't have to. I didn't pay him, by the way. <laughs> no, no, check is in the post. But for those that are detracting, they just look for that type of stuff, you know. And that that's that's why the industry lets itself down. But you can't blame geographies because a lot of the geographies are actually inward investment groups. They're not technology companies. Okay. Um, Gary, you're probably not going to like me anymore. I'm going to lose some, some points with you now, but uh, we are running out of time. We literally got about one minute. Um, we'll skip all the conversation about politics, European politics. Uh, but I just want to ask one question. If there's one thing that you guys want to see done by the end of 2022, if we sit back here in one year's time um, and you expect something to have been done, um, what would it be? Um, very short answers now. So who would like to jump in? Alex, you're unmuted, so let's go with you Ch first. Change, I, I was going to make a comment on the other thing, but change, change the language. Change the language. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's the that's the thing that will help us all. Um, and and just a very 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 quick point, just to to let you know that the, the European Data Centre Association normally responds to about three to five consultations from the EU per year. In the last twelve months, we've we've responded to fifty. Mm -hmm. So that shows how much people are looking at us. Mm -hmm. Amazing, um, Anthony. Um, yeah, I, I think there's there's going to be continued growth, and it it's just don't stop it happening. That's that's all we need. Okay, Tash. Um, yeah, echoing that, and just the education piece. And um, there's lots of because it's such a growing industry. I think yeah, there's a lot of people looking at it, but there's also companies getting involved that don't have the experience. So just helping with with the education. Okay, and David. Um, yeah, I probably would say education of, of policymakers um, as well as the, the wider industry. Um, yeah, Tech UK and Emma Fryer struggles with this on almost a daily basis, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, it's so new that they don't understand it, I think. Well, Amy is doing an amazing work. And Gary, two words. <laughs> I can't do it in two words, but I would very much like 80% of the market is being driven by four companies in Europe, possibly North America as well. 
they need to come out to play. They need to be more visible. They can't be hiding behind others. It's just not any more acceptable. Um, you know, it, we need to see them out fronting up um, and not just hiding behind policy-based people, the engineers, the sustainable people, um, because those four companies are the origin of 80 plus percent, possibly more. Hmm. And uh, uh, that's a real challenge and a disappointment, in my opinion. Hmm. Okay. Um, I agree with everything that everyone said, and I'll probably add in as well to see a bit more diversity um, in 12 months time, um, gender diversity in all other types of diversity will be also very good um, across the sector, across Europe and the world. Uh, but well, thank you so much, guys, for your time, for joining us today. Um, and on behalf of the speakers, I would like to thank everyone for tuning in and participating in today's roundtable. Uh, just a quick reminder, our speakers are staying on for the remainder of the lunch hour to answer any of your questions. And so meet them back in the networking lounge uh, at the table. And to our viewers, if you're, if you're one of the 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. Uh, make sure you visit us at jsa.net to register for more upcoming JSA virtual roundtables including our next one, where leaders in our industry will talk about lessons learned and predictions for the new year for telecoms and data centers. With that, we wrap up today's roundtable. Look out for the playback of this session coming soon on JSA TV and JSA podcast. From me and the team at JSA, we wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we see you back in January. And in the meantime, see you back in the networking lounge and happy networking.